pajamas, giving glances at Neil from time to time to make sure he was still asleep. Then she was outside, staring at the redness to the west where the sun was rising, feeling the cool morning air invigorate her. She rescued the fire by getting down on hands and knees and blowing faint coals to light, by adding twigs and then a big chunk of wood. When the flames were shooting upward, she put the granite coffee pot above it, and began frying bacon in the skillet. The eggs were fluffing nicely when Neil came out and blinked at her sleepily. You're a peppy one, he muttered. An early start, remember. He walked to the lake, knelt on a flat rock, and splashed water on his face. Beth watched him, wondering at his thoughts. Was he telling himself this was all nonsense, this courting of a wife in a wilderness? Would he much rather be in Boston, where all he had to worry about was what girl to call up for a date at night? A date which would be more rewarding than sleeping in an empty cot in a tent? After breakfast, Neil picked up his fishing poles, his creel, his bait box and moved toward the car. Beth went to join him. They would rent a canoe, which Neil would paddle back to their campsite, while she drove the ISO Griffo. It took him close to an hour to bring the canoe to shore. Beth sat on a tree trunk and watched him approach, telling herself he would be tiring himself out in grand fashion. When the canoe grounded, Beth asked him if he wanted to rest. No need for rest, he growled. I'm fine. Maybe I ought to paddle, she suggested. He gave her a black look. Still, when they were out on the lake and wetting their lines, Neil had insisted on baiting her hook, despite her protests that she did it for herself all the time she felt a little guilty. Was she overdoing it? Would he grow suspicious and realize that she was trying to tire him out? Apparently not. He seemed to thrive on activity. Neil caught the first fish, a big bass, biting it for several minutes before Beth could slice the net into the water and scoop it up. Supper, Neil announced triumphantly. Beth caught the next two fish, playing them carefully, giving them line to run, then bringing them up short and reeling in. She worked them skillfully, as her father had taught her, and from time to time heard muttered exclamations from her husband. After he had netted her second face, he studied her slowly. Well done, he said at last. You played those two fish like a real pro. I was my father's only child. I had to play boy for him from time to time. I know all about football, baseball, and hockey. I can fish and shoot a gun. I don't like hunting, but that's because I don't believe in killing wild animals just for fun. But at Windflower Lodge, she shrugged. I thought you wanted to be alone with Candace. Besides, I didn't know you so well, then. And you know me now. Better than I did. Now I'll paddle back. You will not. You will relax and enjoy the trip. Whatever you say, Neil, she answered meekly. In the afternoon they went for a long hike through the woods, along a narrow path that Neil claimed was an Indian trail, long ago. They came to a hill when the trees fell away, giving them a view of the forests and the distant lakes that were tiny blue dots blinking in the sunlight. Almost of its own will, Beth's hand fumbled for Neil's, held it. They stood that way, looking all around them, and then Neil murmured, it's as if we're the only man and woman in the world. A modern day Adam and Eve. Neil was the only man in the world as far as she was concerned, she reflected. If only she were his only woman. A woman he could cling to, to have him to hold, as the saying went, forever. But Neil Harper was not like that. He looked on a woman as a challenge, as someone to overcome with his charm, and when she was firmly hooked like those fates they had caught he would treat her and toss her aside. Beth sighed, saying, time we were getting back. I have fish to cook. And I'll admit, I'm hungry. She was tired, too. 